Francis, can you see me? Sound good? Okay. All right. Well, good evening, friends. My name is Jeremy Rutledge, and I'm senior pastor here at Circular Congregational Church. And it is my delight to welcome you back to the second of our fall lectures in theology and ethics with Carol Wayne White. Our format this evening will be about the same as last evening. <laughs> Carol will speak for around 45 minutes, then she and I will have a short conversation, after which time we'll open it up to questions and conversation with the group. If you're on site with us, then we'll have microphones to bring around for your questions. If you're online, you may email your questions, uh, and we'll repeat this later on, but you can email your questions at any time to circular at circularchurch.org. That's circular at circularchurch.org, and our team will then text those questions to me. We'll do our best to get to as many questions as we can and wrap up around 8.15. For those on site, we'll have a small reception in the courtyard afterwards. I'll keep this introduction brief. If you'd like the fuller version, I invite you to revisit our first lecture at the Circular, Two, Circular Church YouTube channel. But even with the quick introduction, I'd like to pause and thank our administrative team, our technology team, our ushers, and our hospitality volunteers Without your work, we would not be here tonight. And again, special thanks to the Circular Church Endowment Board for graciously underwriting these lectures so that we can make them available to all at no cost. We're so fortunate to have Carol Wayne White with us for a second evening. Carol is professor of the philosophy of religion at Bucknell University and interim director of the Griot Institute for the Study of Black Lives and Cultures. She serves on the board of directors of the Religious Naturalist Association and has published several books and too many chapters and articles to name. Her latest book is Black Lives and Sacred Humanity Toward an African American Religious Naturalism. In her first lecture, Carol offered us the philosophical framework of religious naturalism and spoke of the aesthetic turn to wonder. Tonight, she'll bring prophetic black voices to bear on the project, challenging us to see the deep interconnectedness between our work for racial and environmental justice. A quote from one of the figures she brings to light, Anna Julia Cooper, may serve as a fitting for our evening. Cooper encouraged us not just to think on these things, but to act on them. Life, she wrote, must be something more than dilettante speculation. And religion ought to be, if it isn't, a great deal more than mere gratification of the instinct for worship linked with the straight teaching of irreversible credos Religion must be life made true, and life is action, growth, development, begun now, and ending never. Friends, let us hope so, and let Carol guide us in that work as she presents Embracing Blackness and Overcoming the Diseased Imagination, or Why America Needs Religious Naturalism. Will you join me in welcoming back our friend and teacher, Carol Wayne White. Oh, well, thank you, friend Jeremy. And um, I am so appreciative of that gracious, gracious um, introduction. I'm delighted to be back again this evening. And I do want to say that I, I see us all teaching each other, so I'm hoping that you all will teach me as well. Um, again, extending my profound gratitude for Jeremy for this invitation to join you. Um, again, to Catherine, who 
again, has just exceeded my expectations in terms of making me feel comfortable and welcome. Um, to Charlotte for and all others and Francis who have helped to make the presentation go seamless and everything. And again, thank you all for being here and thank you for the charming Charleston welcome here. Um, several people have asked me if I've been here before and I was only here as a kid so I don't really remember it and being here as an adult is a fascinating experience. So thank you for a lovely, lovely welcome. So the title of my talk, as you see, is Embracing Blackness and Overcoming the Disease and Imagination or Why America Needs Religious Naturalism. And what I'm trying to do today as a follow-up to my talk from yesterday is to actually provide a view of religious naturalism as a type of cultural critique and emphasizing the echo um, implications of religious naturalism and its social relevance in our contemporary era, which some of us have called an era of racial pandemics. Uh, <clears throat> I'll be with you in a moment. I'm getting used to the technology here. Okay, so what I'm going to do basically in this first section is to talk about an ag a legacy of what we're calling constructing the animal other, which I am going to try to contextualize as a legacy of racial and ethnic um, intimidation. In September of 2016, a first year student at East Tennessee State University interrupted a Black Lives Matter protest on campus, parading in a gorilla mask. Clad in overalls and barefoot, the young man offered bananas to the protesting students, heckling them. When set within a larger or wider historical context, this student's actions evoke a legacy of intimidation in which perceived differences attributed to certain humans are symbolized in terms of animal otherness. Early examples of this legacy of othering certain humans and reducing their humanity to animality include Nazi propaganda during the 20s and 30s portraying Jewish citizens as rats and mice that deserved to be exterminated. Elsewhere, during World War II, political cartoons in the United States featured Japanese people as mice and rats, suggesting they should be defeated. And amid anti-Irish fervor in both Great Britain and United States, Irish immigrants were viewed as apes or as wild creatures that had to be controlled. Simian images in particular can be traced back in Western thought as an effective strategy to demarcate a certain notion of normative humanity. In, early platonic, in an early Platonic dialogue, possibly authored by Plato himself, Heraclitus is quoted as saying that the most beautiful of apes is hideous in comparison to humans, and that the wisest of humans are apish in relation to the gods. In Christian context, popular Popular images of the monkey as an image of the devil and the sinner or images of humanity in the state of, de uh, of degeneracy were abundant. For example, during the patristic period in Christianity, certain theologians also used monkey icons to symbolize pagans, heretics, and other enemies 
of Christ. Centuries later, in the United States, Simeon imagery continues to be an effective strategy of anti-black rhetoric with ontological implications. Projected images of African Americans as apes, monkeys, or gorillas justified the institution of slavery and miscegenation laws in the United States. They also reinforced still wide-held stereotypes of black men as beasts with unmanageable sexuality. And as you can see, well, maybe you can't, this particular um, item was taken from the Pittsburgh Press, 1982. You would think it might have been 1958 or something, but this is 1982. <clears throat> More recently in the United States, these ideas have been emboldened and articulated by some younger Americans during the Trump years. This is graffiti found in Maple Grove High School in Minnesota uh, that was uh, drawn attention to by the news stations. And this is 2016. Sadly, this form of animalization to portray blacks as subhuman has not been confined to this nation. As recently as 2017, Penny Sparrow, a white South African real estate agent, commented on Black New Year revelers littering the beach in Durban with these words. From now on, I shall address the Blacks of South Africa as monkeys. I see the cute little wild monkeys do the same, pick and drop litter. And in, in 2014, a liberal Belgian newspaper attempted to evoke satirical humor in simeonizing Barack and Michelle Obama. And these are just few of many, many contemporary examples of the theme that I'm trying to highlight. This persistent theme of representing people of African descent as inferior beings indeed as subpar humans, invites further examination. As religious naturalists, I am particularly concerned that the symbolic value of these gestures is deeply embedded in problematic notions of animality, race, and nature in our country. In short, they offer us a lethal combination of intimately joined white supremacy and species supremacy. With the former, processes of racialization have been influential in an exclusionary category of the human, designating who is properly so and who is not. With the latter, a trajectory of liberal humanism has consistently overestimated the autonomy of human beings, positioning us outside of complex myriad nature and rendering invisible our inextricable connection to other life forms and material processes. Both of these impulses, white supremacy and species supremacy, evoke a hierarchical model of nature built on the great chain of being concept, and they have produced violent and harmful consequences. As for those of you who don't know what the great chain of being in concept, it was a concept during the medieval period where they had this order of existence. And in each sphere, uh, a particular class of entities resided. You had God, angels, kings, queens, commoners, animals, plant-like, non-being things. Things. And where you were ranked um, basically coincided with the worth that was afforded your existence. And so I'm trying to suggest that um, we still see some of that particular type of thinking in our contemporary era. And what follows, I argue that one effective way of challenging both white supremacy and species supremacy is through the lens of religious naturalism. As a, capacious, 
ecological worldview sorry yes as a capacious ecological worldview religious naturalism is a critical intervention in western humanistic thought it shifts attention back to us as natural processes, and it encourages us to question our values, behaviors, and resource uses. In advancing my argument, in the next section, I first trace a perceivable thematic pattern that helped to shape the evolution of black intellectual thought in the United States since the historical slave experience namely how modern processes of racialization generated what I call the disease imagination. It's an ongoing form of human exceptionalism operating within American cultural history and remaining deeply entrenched in this nation's collective psyche that presumes the inferiority of blacks. Then I outline a trajectory of black humanistic discourse that provided a critical response to this form of human exceptionalism. This intellectual tradition is represented by the ideas of Frederick Douglass, Anna Julia Cooper, W.B. Du Bois, and James Baldwin. Building on their ideas, building on their ideas, I then outlined a model a religious nationalism that presupposes human animals deep inextricable homology with each other and with other natural processes, drawing our attention to an expansive view of our humanity as an emergent phenomenon, not an achievement. I contend that what is primarily at stake is how we conceive our humanity as well as the social ethical and ecological implications of that conception. So I would like to begin by talking about the historical context for what you are hearing these days around white supremacy. A lot of people say, what does that really mean? I want to just give a very general overview of how that term came to be to some extent. So one factor contributing to it in the United States was an early modern binary construct that originated in Western Europe. This construct divided human culture from nature into spheres of greater and lesser value. This ideology of dualism was an integral component of Western cultural imperialism as well, where the purported civilized races of Europe distinguish their own normative humanity against other groups that were beginning to encounter in the Americas, Asia, and Africa. And this is part of the explorative era of Western Europe, where many of the explorers, the scientists, and the thinkers, the leading thinkers, were studying other cultures. And what they did, basically, because these other cultures were different, they basically normalized their experience, their identity, and compared the two. Of course, with this ideology of dualism, one being normative, others being less than. So an extension of this nature-culture dichotomy, racialized notions of difference, led to such disparaging views as the savage Native American, and the intellectually inferior Africans. These were two of the major stereotypes that arose during that time. When measured against the idealized Western bourgeois human, Africans in particular were found to be deficient in requisite cognitive, aesthetic, physical, and moral attributes. This epistemological framework was later sanctioned within 19th century scientific studies, or what scholars now call 
the rise of scientific racism. So we're not making this up. This is actually part of the history of Western Europe that was transported to the shores of America. In this picture, from Robert Knox's book, and it was a very popular text, it's one of the most popular texts of the time, called The Races of Man, or Men, the slant of the brow is used to draw connections between the Negro and the orangutan, and those differences between those two and the European. Knox's work expressed the dominant view of the West that race was a major determinant of culture, behavior, and character. And this is where we begin to get the modern construct of race itself, which is a construct based on these interesting observations. It was not science as we know it, but this is what they were calling science at that particular time. Not to be outdone by the Europeans, in 1854, Two American prominent scientists, Josiah C. Knott and George Glidden, with a few others, documented in an influential ethnographic study titled Types of Mankind, they chronicled their perception of objective racial hierarchies with illustrations comparing blacks to chimpanzees, gorillas, and orangutans. They also included images comparing the skulls of the Greek, the Negro, and the chimpanzee, seeking to show a hierarchy of development linking blacks to primates. Elsewhere in Europe, this was not isolated, my friends. Elsewhere in Europe, the German thinker Ernest Haeckel we included this image in his study to support his theory of polygenesis. In doing so, he was actually countering Darwin's theory of revolution that proposed a common ancestry for humanity. So Heckel's views were counter to what Darwin was saying, but they were still popular. And they helped also to give rise to German Nazism um, around the extinction of the Jews. Yes, some of his ideas were perpetuated in later thought. Some of these earlier scientific studies also contribute uniquely to the idea of whiteness. This is where we begin to get this idea of whiteness as a normative way of being human. The idea of whiteness as a normative category for establishing a group's humanity, as well as declaring the superiority of the human species from other organic life and animals, as found in this passage by the French thinker, author of Gobineau. So Gobineau went even further. Not only did he talk about distinctions within the human realm, he also said humans are better than other forms of life. And this is where you begin to get a more robust form of what I'm calling this white supremacy and species supremacy. It's really crystallized in um, the Gobineau's work. In a major work that was again widely read, embellished, and publicized by many different kinds of writers, he explicitly declared the animal character of African Americans, which would become part of a long-standing form of anti-black rhetoric in American culture. So what I'm trying to suggest is that these European thinkers, some American thinkers, Many of these ideas were published by the leading thinkers of the day, and they were transported to American shores when America was founded, hence slavery. We all know about that. So we have these constellation of ideas helping us to establish a nation in which slavery was seen as legitimate until certain people spoke out against it. So what does the Gabino say? say? He says, I have shown the unique place in the organic world occupied by the human species, the profound, the profound physical as well as moral differences separating it from all other kinds of living creatures. That's where you get the humans 
supremacy, the species supremacy. Considering it by itself, I have been able to distinguish on, physio on physiological grounds alone three great and clearly marked types. Again, the construction of race, the black, the yellow, and the white. The Negroid variety is the lowest and stands at the foot of the ladder. The animal character that appears in the shape of the pelvis is stamped on the Negro from birth and foreshadows his destiny. His intellect will always move within a very narrow circle. This marking of blacks and animality justified European colonialism and highlighted the belief in the role of the Europeans as a civilizing force in the world. And who came to America? Europeans, discontented Europeans fleeing themselves from a certain type of um, tribulation. So this is heavy. I know it's heavy, it's very sobering, it's part of our history, not black history, it's part of our history, and that's what I want us to think about here. So in part two, there arose within black culture those who were allowed to be educated a confrontation of this disease imagination. It is disease. It's not a holistic understanding of who we are. And there were several responses from what I'm calling a black intellectual trajectory. Addressing the adverse effects of this racialized reasoning has been one of the hallmarks of African American religious and intellectual culture. You know of many religious leaders in the African American culture who have challenged this through the idea of God, but there are also some who challenge it through humanistic ideas as well. Visionary thinkers, leaders address the ethical, aesthetic, and ontological implications involved in the ongoing task of asserting the fact that African Americans also are human. Among the earliest articulations is that given by Frederick Douglass, who labeled the perceived black degradation rooted in the minds of his white contemporaries, the disease imagination. It's actually from Douglass that we get this term, the disease imagination. As well, anticipating the generative power of this disease imagination that was reflected in not in Glidden's popular study that I referenced earlier, Types of Mankind. Frank Douglas actually read the text and he knew what it was saying. And at a commencement speech that he gave at Western Reserve College in 1854, he actually referenced this text and said, of all the efforts to disprove the unity of the human family and to brand the Negro with natural inferiority, the most compendious and bare face is the book entitled Rights of Mankind. In the late 19th century, in her feminist collection of essays and speeches entitled A Voice from the South, Anna Julia Cooper, another luminary, brilliant, thinker challenged the different ways African Americans were systematically dehumanized and denaturalized as the other. What's important in Cooper's assessment is that the humanity of African Americans was removed from the natural order of abundant human life and classified as something different, something other. Attributes who normally associate with human beings such as agency, genius, creativity, etc., were divorced from black bodies whose only worth was accorded to their physical capabilities, which then, as we all know, was one of the motivating factors behind slavery, historical black slavery. 
Cooper envisioned an ideal view of American culture that inspired and enabled every person to attain fullness of being and to flourish as part of the whole. Her cultural criticism rested on the cosmological notion that interconnectedness is one of the basic features of life and that all entities are members of each other. Her humanistic discourse astutely suggested to her contemporaries that the philosophical mind sees that its own rights are the rights of humanity, the one and the all. In the same era, W.B. Du Bois conceptualized life behind the veil of race and the resultant double consciousness, a sense of always looking at oneself through the eyes of others, conveyed his aspirations for African Americans to look anew at themselves, to reinvent themselves, and not ingest that disease imagination that was perpetuating in a culture around African Americans. The ongoing inspiration that Du Bois provided to his contemporaries was inextricably tied to his image of African Americans as centers of value whose self-generating genius and potency had become ossificated by life behind the veil. In Souls of Black Folk, he consistently characterizes black creative agents with an innate desire for subjectivity, making clear to the reader that blacks have been incessant dreamers of ontological integrity. Thus, while naming the discriminatory practices and moral deficiencies of a nation that kept black folk from achieving their full humanity, Du Bois also reminded African Americans of the task set before them. As he writes, this then is the end of their striving to be co-workers in the kingdom of culture, to escape both death and isolation, to husband and use our best powers and latent genius. In the mid 20th century, James Baldwin also dreamt the brave new conceptions of humanity beyond the vexed race configurations he both experienced and witnessed in the United States, as well as in parts of Western Europe. When he returned to the US from Europe in the mid 60s, Baldwin wrote extensively about racial distortions imposed upon our shared humanity. In the absence of embodied authenticity, and relational integrity, Baldwin employed the bastard metaphor to reveal the pathology inherent in many whites' refusal to embrace their familial, even biological kinship with blacks. For Baldwin, the bastard term symbolized the moral paralysis he saw embedded in American psyche, suffering from a great lie perpetuated by white supremacy. While insisting that whites see themselves as in black and as black, Baldwin emphatically stated, it is so simple a fact, and one that is so hard apparently to grasp, whoever debases others is debasing himself. For Baldwin, what humans can become and what we wish to be depends on how we act in the here and now. In the most immediate sense, this construction of humanity is dependent on racial acts of love, of embracing otherness within oneself and as oneself. So in the next section, I want to build upon these critical insights from these iconic figures as they are expressed in religious naturalism. What I wish to do is to suggest that the cultural intellectual legacy established by Douglas, Cooper, Du Bois, and Baldwin promoted the humanity of African Americans at historical junctures when it was questioned and denied. More important, 
Their brave efforts show that when blackness is defined in a narrow sense or negatively marked as different, the more capacious visions of our entangled shared humanity become marred and distorted. Their collective work thus provides the impetus and vision for a more naturalized formulation of humanity in the 21st century that I see grounded in the tenets of religious naturalism. From this model of religious naturalism, as I spoke extensively about yesterday, I'll just highlight a few of these features. There is the idea of the materiality of being human. The advances of the science through both biology and physics have served to demonstrate not only closely linked human animals are with nature, but that we are simply one branch of a seemingly endless natural cosmos. As Donald Crosby states here, nature requires no explanation beyond itself. It always has existed and it always will exist in some shape, form, or manner. Its constituents, principles, laws, and relations are the sole reality. This reality takes on new traits and possibilities as it evolves inexorably through time. And this is the part for us to ponder. Human beings are integral parts of nature, and we are natural beings through and through. We, like all living beings, are outcomes of biological evolution. As I emphasized again yesterday, according to loyal rule, and religious naturalists affirm this, humans are highly complex organisms on our lives we have to the emergence of hierarchies of natural systems. Expressed much more succinctly, humans are ultimately the manifestations of many interlocking systems, atomic, molecular, biochemical, anatomical, ecological, apart from which human existence is incomprehensible. Religious naturalism also affirms our constitutive relationality that I highlighted yesterday or last evening, and that we basically, through our very constitution, are relational, and that our wholeness occurs within a matrix of com complex interconnectedness, or in ways of conjoining with others that transform us. As Ursula Goodenough contends in her very wonderful text, Sacred Depths of Nature, we are all connected all the way down. As this is one of my favorite passages in her text. We have throughout the ages sought connection with higher powers in the sky or beneath the earth or with ancestors in some other realms. We've also sought and found religious fellowship with one another. And now we realize that we are connected to all creatures, not just in food chains or ecological equilibria. We share a common ancestor. We share genes, receptors, and cell cycles, and signal transduction cascades. We share evolutionary constraints and possibilities. We are connected all the way down. So in this next section, I want to highlight how religious naturalism can move us beyond this disease imagination with its particular insights. It emphasizes the human as an emergent, interconnected life form amid spectacular bi biotic diversity. And in this context, Religious nationalism has interesting implications for us to consider. First of all, it can help us challenge the most viral constructions of isms rooted in problematic and alienating self-other differentiations, especially racially constructed ones that the enduring legacy of African-American religiosity and humanism have targeted. So any inkling of white supremacy or any sense of cultural superiority is antithetical to this natural view. 
They are excused cultural constructions, excused cultural constructions that have been forced and imposed on the wholeness of natural interrelatedness and deep genetic homology that evolution has wrought. Hope you all understood that. Racism, all of the isms, homophobia, xenophobia, transphobia, class, they're all human imposed constructions upon our natural interrelatedness, our natural interrelatedness. Second, religious naturalism helps us undermine a dominant cultural fantasy that's very popular in the United States around what we call the Great Divide, that we really are ontologically better than other species. This premise assumes that the human alone is not a spatial and temporal web of interspecies dependencies, and has lent theoretical support to the popular myth of the self-made individual in the United States. With Donna Haraway, we then reject this fantasy and we appreciate our intricate entanglement with other material processes. I love this also from Donna Haraway. She writes, I love the fact that human genomes can be found in only about 10% of all the cells that occupy the mundane space I call my body. The other 90% of the cells are filled with the genomes of bacteria, fungi, protists, and such, some of which play in a symphony necessary to my being alive at all, and some of which are hitching a ride and doing the rest of me, of us, no harm. I am vastly outnumbered by my tiny companions. Better put, I become an adult human being in company with these tiny messmates. To be one is always to become We all know that gut health is really crucial these days. Um, the bacteria and all the things, uh, it's the center of our health these days, and we know that. So, propelling citizens of our nation beyond that diseased imagination that Frederick Douglass first identified, religious naturalism entertains new moral imaginations that resist a lethal formulation of binary logics that is imposed on all forms of nature. In returning to the simian imagery that I began with, I suggest that religious nationalism can help us think intelligently and compassionately about the layers of exploitation endemic to the processes of racialization of nature I've tried to outline. In other words, what I'm trying to suggest is that while we should be rightfully troubled by the images of African Americans or people of African descent being characterized as apes in terms of being considered subhuman, we should also be very concerned about the speciesism that's implicit in those types of rhetoric. We should be concerned about how, how the great apes themselves are being exploited and how association of certain humans with them is seen as negative. We should be aware of that. That's a form of speciesism here. We should be compassionate about our co-primates in the same way we want to be compassionate about African Americans and how white supremacy has adversely affected them. In his study, Raymond Corby called the metaphysics of apes. He argues that in the context of imperialist and colonization expansions, certain wild animals, apes in general, and gorillas in particular, came to be seen as powerful personifications of wilderness that must be fought and conquered by civilized Westerners. Same analogy to some extent. He also grants that these notions were prevalent before the later 19th century notion that humans were connected to nature rather than apart from it. 
In a recent study, my colleague at Bucknell, Karen Morin, who's a geographer, has also made some important connections between anti-black racism and speciesism. She demonstrates in this text how the processes of animalization, the very notion of animalization, um, have subjected both certain humans and certain non-humans into hierarchies of worthiness and value. As she writes, fundamental to how and why certain prisoners and certain animals can be exploited, objectified, or made killable within the prison, the farm, the research lab, and the zoo are the social constructions of the human-non-human -human divide. She calls this carceral logics and the social meanings that are attached to various bodies and populations. Morin further notes that racial difference is foundational to much of the rhetoric of criminal as animal. And note how often you hear that, those animals, they should be put behind bars. You hear it, it's said so often, people are not really pondering to think about the speciesism implied in those particular articulations. Particularly, Morin highlights in her text, the criminal as animal is always attached or primarily attached to representations of black and other minoritized men. In conclusion, what would I like you to take away from this? I would like for you to think about the fact that religious naturalism focuses attention on the various forms of suffering that occur when, when we distort the wholeness of nature's sentience. One step towards decolonizing nature, towards making it less vulnerable, is in honoring this sentience, which is an essential part of being alive, experiencing others, and being affected by others, and experiencing well-being. And sentience is the capacity to suffer, to feel. And this is what we're talking about here. In honoring all materiality, religious naturalism compels us to cast aside problematic bifurcations of human materiality cast in racial and ethnic terms that often result in an us versus them mentality. Religious naturalism also invites us to reconceive our humanity in an expanded sense, alerting us to these key insights. One, Humans are phylogenetically phylogen related to all of nature. Two, harm done to any of natural processes, inclusive of human organisms, is harm done to all. Three, the legacy of the animal other often contains both explicit and hidden implicit forms of speciesism. I leave you with these thoughts. Religious naturalism also contributes to a more robust notion of echo justice. Inspired by the claims of religious naturalism, we can better identify and resist the subtle processes of racialization of nature endemic to American environmental history. For example, religious naturalism joins with the environmental justice movement in concurrently advocating this means all at the same time. Let's not divide up our energies there. This is more important. Let us try to understand these intersectional forms of oppression. Concurrently advocating against the depletion of natural resources, challenging the policies that both create land polluted by landfills, oil refineries, and nuclear waste repositories, that force poor racial and ethnic communities to live near, fighting for referendums that preserve the delicate ecosystems supporting whales, dolphins, and other animals. And there are many more of these important um, ecological principles. Religious naturalism, in the last resort, encourages us to have willing participation in movements of scientific inquiry, movements of cultural expression, 
movements for global distributive justice, movements to eliminate needless suffering, and movements to preserve the ecology of our home planet. Thank you. I went from joy to a very sobering <laughs> message tonight. I hope you all. Thank you much again, Carol. And if you are joining us online, again, if you have a question, you can email it to circular at circularchurch.org, and it will get texted to me in a moment. So I had a few questions, Carol. Okay. But I want to be mindful of my time and also get to the group. I had one question from each writer, but I think I'll just use two. Okay. <laughs> um, Cooper and Baldwin. Okay. Because I wanted to lift up their voices in our time together. So from Cooper, I have this. Um, she wrote, nature's language is not writ in cipher. Her notes are always simple and sensuous and the very meanest recesses and commonest byways are fairly deafening with her sermons and songs. It is only when we ourselves are out of tune through our pretentiousness and self-sufficiency or we are blinded and rendered insensate by reason of our foreign and unnatural cultivation, that we miss her meanings and inadequately construe her multiform lessons. Mm. And as I read um, your text, Black Lives and Sacred Humanity, and the way you lifted up Cooper's voice and what she was writing in the 19th century uh, from not far away in North Carolina, right. it just struck me how unnatural all the isms are, especially racism, but how unnatural sexism is, heterosexism, wow. classism, all the things you mentioned. Yes. And I just wondered for you, um, you know, Cooper, Cooper has this idea that we're just not paying attention. We're not, if we, we become unattuned, or you know, we're out of tune, then, then we miss what nature is teaching us. Mm -hmm. um, was there ever a time when you felt like you got into tune somehow, or you were, you were out of step with nature, um, with what nature was um, teaching through her songs and sermons, and you, you somehow got in with that? If that question makes sense, like, was there a time when you came to that and it, it became clear to you? Thank you for actually highlighting Cooper. Um, sh before I answer, I recommend that you read her text, A Voice from the South. It's one of the most um, illuminating texts around the turn of the century written by African-American woman who just synthesized all of the various ideas that were circulating. And she was in conversation with a number of the leading transcendentalists, the leading European thinkers. Um, and just amazing insights at that time. So to, to answer your question, Jeremy, um, I'm not sure it was just an aha moment as it was more of a gradual awareness of the profundity of nature. Because um, I think I've always been, as a kid, in tune with something more that I associate with nature. 
but it really wasn't until I think um, I found the language and some of the scholarly stuff that it, I had one of those aha uh -huh moments, sort of. So I think I've always had that sort of inclination, if you will. Okay. Thank you for that question. Thanks. Yeah, mm -hmm. and really, I was asking because I think I think many of us. Um, I'm wondering fall about out you. Of step. How yeah. about you? <laughs> um, <laughs> Well, I think um, for, maybe this is true for a lot of us. As a child, it was natural. Mm -hmm. I was tuned in. Mm -hmm. And then you find yourself in classrooms or offices or very human spaces, very yes. closed off spaces. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And so then it required, um, uh, this is embarrassing to say, but I'll say it, it required scheduling time outside. It oh, required yeah. building mm -hmm. you know, nature back into my life. Yes. Um, so, I do have a confession. <laughs> One reason why I wanted to become a professor, I never wanted to work at a nine to five job. I hated the idea of being indoors and sitting in a, so I, uh, that was one of the sort of more benign reasons why I love being in the academy where I can go sit out and whatever. So I, yeah, so I had that inclination in me that there was this wondrous world out there that I knew was drawing me towards it. Right. So thank you. Sure. Um, and I'm just going to ask one more so that there's time for the group as well. Um, this is from Baldwin in just something that you lifted up, which really struck me. Um, and I, I'm going to read it and then ask a quick question. But Baldwin writes, life is tragic simply because the earth turns and the sun inexorably rises and sets. And one day for each of us, the sun will go down for the last, last time. Perhaps the whole the human trouble is that we will sacrifice all the beauty of our lives. We'll imprison ourselves in totems, taboos, crosses, blood sacrifices, steeples, mosques, races, armies, flags, nations, in order to deny the fact of death, which is the only fact that we have. It seems to me that one ought to rejoice in the fact of death, ought to decide indeed to earn one's death, by confronting with passion the conundrum of life. One is responsible to life. Mm. Wow. And I just wondered if you might say a word on your understanding of mortality as a religious naturalist. Oh, yeah. I, I, I'm glad you don't want me to comment on that. I just would love for it to stand on its own. Oh, Such yeah. a beautiful mm -hmm. passage from Baldwin. Oh, mortality. I, I, as a religious naturalism, I do think of death as a natural phenomenon. I don't think that humans are any different from any other species. And so in some of my work, I talk about what people often see as life, death, antithesis. It's really, they're just frames for what goes between the two, uh, birth, birth and, and death. What's important is what is happening after you are here and before you die. That's the most important thing. And that's what I emphasize, the here and now, and what do you make of your life as you're living, unfolding in its natural realm. And when it's over, um, for me, it's over. But not in terms of how others know me and have loved me and I've loved others. So. We do live on in others in that way, but the biological part is it. So, and I, I, I don't want to die tomorrow, but I, I do, um, I do think it's a natural phenomenon. Yeah. Right. Right. Thank you. And I wonder, and I'm tying Cooper to Baldwin. I can't really help it, but I think of the one and the many. Yes. And death. We yeah. think of death. I think in ego, you know, egocentric terms. So I think right. of my own death, but the many won't die. Yes. I will, you right. know, but, but life itself, that connectedness, that will continue. Exactly, so, exactly. Um, and we're part of the larger whole. And our cells decompose and become part of the natural world. Yeah, it's really cool to think about. Right, oh, we'll return, you know, some of that DNA to where, it, mm -hmm. where some of the stardust will continue yes. to, to be yeah. passed around. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to come down the stairs, and if you have a question and you raise your hand, I'll bring the microphone to you. I'm also going to turn on my phone to get some texts. If you have a question uh, from home, please send it in and we'll, we'll get it. I 
can go ahead and just say your name and your question. Hi, Virginia. I'm Virginia. And my question is just a simple one. Um, Cooper, is that book um, still published? Can yes. we get Absolutely, okay. yes. So we, it's accessible. That's wonderful. Yes, I hope is. we all were able and, to read And there's a renaissance of interest in her, by the way. So you'll find a new Penguin edition has just come out. So, yeah, she's very much in the limelight now. Fantastic. Okay. Wonderful. Thank, thank you. you thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, for the hope that you've offered. Um, my name is Mary. I am a science teacher educator in the academy and so celebrate up here because if what you're saying, wonder, is the thing that makes us most human and most in touch with our ability to care for the world and each other. Our science students are not experiencing that in oh. their K-12 public education. And our teachers themselves are being mandated to teach to culturally insensitive, prescriptive, normative tests. So in a sense, we're dehumanizing the very activity that could lead to wonder, mm. you know, if we taught in this way. So yesterday you called for a movement, you know, and there's wonderful research out there by Louise Chawla that talks about the, the benefits of nature contact for children. So how do we say even at the constituent level of a school board, use this data on the nature, on the health benefits of nature contact and wonder to change the way we teach our students? Yeah, th that's a challenge. The how is the challenge in part, because in certain states it's easier than in other states, and a lot depends on whether it's public, private. Up in Lewisburg where I live, there, which is a college town, a number of the parents who are associated with Bucknell have formed their alternative school, which is nature-centered. And I know that happens in other isolated places too. It's the public system, I think, that becomes problematic. And I don't, I mean, I don't know, the, I don't know if there's a formulaic approach to it. I would suggest that those of you who are working with school boards try to um, offer insights to those leaders that helps them to see some of the things you're talking about, how nature is so beneficial, uh, ex exposure, immersion in nature is so beneficial to us that we're natural beings. And also that um, in terms of the ecological crisis, if we don't stop, we're not even going to be here to have any type of future at all. So. I mean, it's a hard, hard question, the how question, because of the disparities, disparities in how people are understanding who we are. But I think, for me, religious naturalism um, is being promoted in beautiful ways, in the academy in particular. And many of those kids who might not feel that joy, if they come to college, they might get more of that my students, I get a lot of science students in my class, and they, they love it. I offer a course in religious naturalism, and they love it because they're getting exactly what you're saying. So I think it's up to each of us to try to figure out how, how to do that and how to promote these types of values. And it doesn't have to necessarily be religious naturalism, but just understanding that the separation from nature that's part of our dominant culture is killing us and everything around us. Thank you for that question and, con and those comments. You got me thinking about a lot of things, what you said last night. I also read your book. Oh. And so uh, one thing I, I noticed, I uh, was reading the New Yorker this morning, and it seems like one thing you say in your book, Black Lives and Sacred Humanity. And one of the underlying themes, I believe, is despite the fact that black lives as slaves were so restricted, you talked about relativity. Relativity was certainly uh, not, not encouraged for slaves. And yet I read something 
that despite that, that uh, black slaves uh, cultivated this wonder that you talked about so well last night. And, and, uh, and so I was reading, and there's an exhibition now at the Metropolitan Museum of Art that was inspired by the ceramics, by the potters in Edgefield, South Carolina, where there's a lot of red clay, a lot of white bigotry and history there too. But there, there's this fella, uh, Dan the Potter, who is among artists, is, is really is, is so well known. Even though he was a, a very anonymous, he was a slave, and yet some of his work still exists, and it has inspired this exhibition of, of black contemporary artists. And one thing he made was these huge pots, storage pots, which still exist. And uh, it, it, in the one of the highlights of this exhibition, and Dave the Potter wrote some poems. He inscribed poems on his pots. Uh, and I'm going to read one of them that, that was. Uh, mentioned in the little article, uh, he said, I wonder where is all my relation, friendship to all and every nation. Uh, mm -hmm. And he says other things like that. And I thought that was, I don't know, I wouldn't have noticed that maybe if otherwise. And another thing, uh, I was really interested in the Baldwin part of your book. And uh, Baldwin, um, one thing, I, I noticed the same, the same passage that uh, Jeremy read, and, and if Jeremy hadn't read it, I was going to read it, because I had it more. Because it's so marvelous. I mean, Baldwin, <laughs> Baldwin is, well, a genius of the English language. Uh, but um, Baldwin uh, talks about the, the white God. And he kind of indicates that, on the one hand, you have a Dan the Potter who uh, surpasses his, his circumstances. But you also have, and, and Baldwin talks about this, that uh, through all this period, that uh, probably it was impossible that people didn't incorporate this idea of this transcendent authoritarian God, the Lord who certainly was associated with the master, a master God. And uh, Baldwin uh, uh, feels that that has, that has, since you used the disease metaphor, mm -hmm. that, that has infected, uh, uh, it certainly represents a lot of white religiosity, but has also infected black religion. Mm -hmm. And that got me to thinking about, uh, he's not here to defend himself, I don't Think. Probably doesn't think there are many voters here, but we have the only black Republican senator here in South Carolina. And uh, I wondered about Tim Scott, Senator Tim Scott. I wondered about his religiosity, and so I kind of looked it up. And uh, Tim Scott belongs to a mega church. Okay. Uh, no, I don't. <laughs> no, I don't. But, but. But in this mega church, there's the, there's the prosperity gospel, and the, it's but it is very different from Senator Raphael Wano, and and uh, well, I have one other thing, and then I'll, I'll, <laughs> I'm sorry about going on, but uh, what you said about also about, and I don't know why uh, Miss Cooper has been so marginalized. But, um, and, and why are we just learning about her? But uh, because of, uh, I, I think of, of what you got me thinking about is that you talk about romanticism and the transcendentalist Whitman, and you mentioned Whitman, and, there was a, and, and this idea of Wanda again, and, and Wanda bringing you up, and uh, Wanda, and so I noticed this, this poem that uh, came to my attention. Uh, in the writer's almanac today by Coleridge. And it says, what if you slept, it's very short, what if you slept and what if you, in your sleep, you dreamed 
And what if in your dream you went to heaven and there plucked a strange and beautiful flower? And what if when you awoke, you had that flower in your hand? Ah, what then? Where can wonder lead us? Sorry. Thank you for that meditation. I very appreciate it. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and I also want to, I'll look around this room. There is um, a very particular question from online. There's a what type of question? A very particular question. Particular. So, um, and Bill asks, how can religious naturalism help offer a reconception of carceral spaces? And then he adds, to resist Jeremy Bentham's uh, carceral panopticon, which I'm not personally familiar with. But I think Bill is asking, how can, we, how can naturalism help us to reconceive of those? those and who's spaces? the name again? Bill. Bill, mm -hmm. actually, um, I have a uh, short, if you write to me, Bill, I have a short piece um, that actually responds to this whole idea of carceral logics mm -hmm. as to how religious naturalism can help. And so um, I, rather than take up, because it's a more extended response <laughs> than I'm able to give, but please see white at bucknell.edu and I'll send you my piece and that will provide the answer that you're looking for. Okay. But definitely it does. I, I think it can because religious naturalism tries to overcome the, that nature culture binarism, or does, um, through its understanding of what I call the, the intactness of evolution itself and okay. nature's sentience. And I'm glad you also cited Bentham because I highlight that as well in another article. Thank you. Thanks. And Bill, I know, I know you, so I can also send an email okay, uh, great. to connect both of you on that question. Thank you so much for that question. And I'm looking, I have, I have a question if no one else does, but I really want to see if anyone else had the final question in, in the room. There was one in the back. Yes. <laughs> Hi, Anne. Anne. Okay, thank you so much uh, for joining us. And uh, let's say I, I just, um, the concept of wondering. So I'm really wondering about if we're really reaching uh, children, uh, our youth, uh, and helping them to see that interconnectedness. Because that was, for me, a synthesizing moment uh, where somebody actually was here at Circular talking about our structure, you know, that whole cellular, molecular, all of that and how we were 90% related. And that was like this synthesizing moment that sort of changed my landscape of view. So I just wonder if it's, mostly it's like an area of research for me now to think about whether children are really being exposed to this mm. concept. Do you have any thoughts on that? I, I have a very quick response on the Religious Naturalist Association, we have a section around children, wonder, and religious naturalism. So if you go to the link, RNA, Religious Naturalist Association, we do talk a lot about um, why it's important for young people and kids to understand these particular principles. So it's somewhere in our um, website that you can find some sources, resources. Thank you for your question and concern. <laughs> yeah, well, th and thank you so much, everyone, for being with us on site and joining us online. Um, special thanks to Carol for joining us uh, all the way from Pennsylvania. It's been And Rehoboth Beach. <laughs> and Rehoboth Beach, also <laughs> Delaware, shout yes, out. Yeah. We're so glad to have you with us and Great. grateful. Um, and we just hope that all of this good thinking will inspire and inform our action together as a community. Um, if you're here with us on site, we can go back to the courtyard for a little bit more conversation. Um, 
Otherwise, with May gratitude, I have one final love word. To give you uh, the last word. Thank you all for coming out on a Friday night. I know it's, <laughs> that's quite a feat, so I appreciate you coming out, and also those who are online. Um, thank you for your attention to my ideas, and um, please feel free to write me. I, I love to engage in conversation about these, for me, exciting ideas and transformative principles that I think can help us. And have a good evening. Everyone be well. Thank you so much. Thank you.